can we start? Good evening, everyone. I have I welcome everyone for this webinar today. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Krishnan Srira. He will be talking on capturing the illicit diagnosis of malnutrition, the new GLIMP criteria. And before we begin the program, I request Dr. Mary Pramila to say a word of prayer. Shall we close our eyes and bow our heads and look to God for a moment, seeking his blessings on this program. Our most gracious and loving Father God, we thank you, Master, for your gift of life and for your presence with us in all that we do. We ask for your special grace and presence at this uh, webinar. We ask that you will bless the speaker and every participant who is attending this program. May this webinar be one that is useful and that will, that will give us much wisdom and may we use it for your glory. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Thank you, Dr. Sriram. This is such a pleasure to have you here on board with us. And it's always a learning experience for all of us here. I now request Dr. Suganti. And this is on part of, uh, on behalf of NSI, Chennai chapter and WCC Department of Home Science. We are organizing this webinar. I now request uh, Dr. Suganti, the co-convener of NSI to introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon. I take great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Krishnan Sriram. Dr. Krishnan Sriram is currently a tele-intensivist with the U.S. Veteran Affairs Tele-Critical Care at Chicago, USA. His former positions include Division Chair and Fellowship Program, Director of Surgical Critical Care, as well as Director Nutrition Support Team at Cook County Hospital, Chicago. Dr. Sriram is a member of various societies and serves on the editorial boards of several journals. He is a founder president of Indian Society for Parental and Enteral Nutrition and was involved with the formation of Parental and Enteral Nutrition Society of Asia. Dr. Sriram has conducted educational programs in Asian countries adapting Western standards to local conditions. His main interests include early enteral feeding, oral nutritional supplement, micronutrients and team building, empowering dietitians and utilizing telemedicine technology for nutrition related patient care, areas in which he has several publications and presentations at national and international meetings. We are indeed very fortunate to have you today, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see my first slide? Yeah, yeah, we yes, can. Okay. There is a, I have a feeling that there are two screens. Can you see just one screen or two screens? No, I just one, one, just one. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So uh, although I work in the US now, please remember I did work in Madras in Chennai at uh, the former Tamil Nadu Hospital and Ramachandra Medical College. So what I'm going to tell you is not something that is practiced in Europe or Canada or US, but something that has been done here. And I've trained numerous dietitians who have gone out into the world. Uh, uh, and part of my job is also confident building. And uh, to put it into perspective, I want dietitians to be able to look into a doctor's eye and say, doctor, you do your job as a dietitian, that, uh, I mean, as a physician, let me, die. Let me do my job as a dietitian. So I've given you my email there in case any one of you want to communicate with me. Now, the objectives of my, uh, of my session are, I want to describe the current guidelines for nutrition screening and how to diagnose malnutrition at screening or at risk for malnutrition. This confusion between nutrition screening and nutrition assessment. And I will uh, go into, the, uh, into what do you really mean by malnutrition? But I want to focus a lot on the importance of using a standardized, uh, uh, a standardized uh, way of, of, uh, uh, of diagnosing malnutrition, the new global leadership initiative on malnutrition, which is called GLIM. 
And this is the future. This is how nutrition assessment has to be done. The consequences of malnutrition, the group here doesn't have to be told that when you have a malnourished patient, either as an outpatient or as an, or as an inpatient, they suffer and there's a greater chance of dying. And a main objective of my session is to empower dietitians and nutritionists so that you can be bold enough to educate physicians. There is a huge confusion about what in heavens does malnutrition mean? Different people think differently. There is a disconnect between professionals. Among doctors, surgeons, and physicians think differently. Among dietitians also, they think differently. Um, yeah, some dietitians deal with obesity, not realizing that obesity is also a form of malnutrition. And in the Malnutrition Awareness Week in 2016, this is a poster. It says it all. If it was easy to see, it would be easy to diagnose. Unfortunately, malnutrition diagnosis is not very easy. Now, if you have a patient in a hospital with a, let's say, a liver infection or a brain infection, meningitis, and the physician says, I'm not going to treat it, that's medical malpractice. Similarly, if you have a patient who's been diagnosed to have malnutrition and nothing is done, then that is also medical malpractice. Unfortunately, this goes on every day, partly because physicians are not knowledgeable and partly because dietitians are not bold enough to say, this is not the standard of practice and this is not the right way to handle it. Unfortunately, physicians have a blind spot when it comes to nutrition. In our MBBS and postgraduate courses, what it emphasizes is community nutrition. And enteral and parenteral nutrition is not covered at all. And there is this strange concept that malnutrition occurs only in poor socioeconomic status in rural areas. How can my patient be malnourished when they are coming to my hospital in a BMW or a Mercedes Benz car? And uh, when a patient is fat, how can that patient be malnourished? Not realizing that malnutrition can occur in anyone. Any one of you in this audience too can become malnourished by present definitions by this evening, if you do not, uh, if you fall sick or end up being in a hospital. And so we depend upon nutritionists with varying experience. Now, many of the nutritionists who are being trained are really well trained, but their experience in the hospital is very limited and it is also not very compulsory. Now, it is absolutely true that not everyone who finishes a BSc or an MSc in home science or nutrition will go on to work in a hospital. Absolutely true. But a little bit of exposure to the hospital, I think, is important for your own families. Now, in Canada, in 2011, 20, uh, 10 years ago, they did a survey of physicians asking them, how much do you know about uh, malnutrition? What is your interest? What is the relevance of malnutrition to the treatment of the patient? You will see, we would prefer all the physicians to have a high score of 10, but actually the scores varied from 5 to 7.5, which is absolutely terrible. Even the self-reported knowledge of the treatment of malnutrition was very, very poor among physicians. And unfortunately, if you ask them, are you practicing good evidence-based medicine? The answer would be yes, but not, that is not true. There are various physician-related factors, overconfidence. There are systemic factors. What do I mean by systemic factors? Systemic factors means it's like a factory system. Something is wrong in the hospital itself. The, the dietitians are not given the power to tell physicians, no, you cannot do this operation because the patient is being Who's going to pay for simple things? Unfortunately, insurance companies will pay for all kinds of things, but they will not pay for 100 rupees worth of enteral or oral supplements. And uh, administrative support, how are we going to protect time? Systemic factors also include dietitians who are well qualified but they are put in charge of the kitchen. Kitchen dietitians are, cannot be the same as clinical dietitians. And there are various guidelines and folks get confused with American guidelines and uh, Canadian guidelines and uh, Australian guidelines and so on. So what happens is when a patient has a disease and a medical encounter, you got to make a quick diagnosis and a decision and a prescription should be done. In other words, a prescription, uh, it does not mean intravenous nutrition. It means just oral supplements. 
And um, if no therapy is given, then there is no improvement. And that is what we call clinical inertia. And therefore, patients go on to die in a hospital because the malnutrition component of their disease is not addressed. Now, this is a nice window of opportunity for Asian countries. Can you, uh, can you guys see the, the title at the top of the slide or is it being hidden? Uh, which one? No, at the top, a window of opportunity. Do you yes, yes, we yes. can see. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. So this is a window of opportunity for us in Asia because this is a study just published about three or four months ago of a study of almost three million patients in several hospitals in America. Malnutrition was documented uh, only in four to four point three percent. The truth is, anyone coming to the hospital with the with a diagnose with a diagnostic uh, role that I'm going to be talking to you with a diagnostic method, close to forty percent of patients are malnourished. So, and the funny thing here in this study was, of the four percent of patients who were diagnosed to be malnourished, only fifteen percent actually received some kind of oral nutrition therapy. In fact, is close to 35% of patients who were malnourished were not even uh, recognized. And so this is a great uh, opportunity for Asian countries, including India. And this will be a very nice study for one of you guys to do, uh, to find out exactly what is the capturing of malnutrition in our hospital, which should be 30 to 40%. Now, the American Society for Parental Nutrition, Aspen, the key leaders in the world and the key supporters of dietitians in the world, clearly state that screening is necessary for all hospitalized patients. All of you know this is a requirement in India that you have to screen, but nobody cares about what kind of screening. In uh, many places, it is only uh, uh, a something that is done by inexperienced dietitians just to satisfy the administrator and just to tell the government we are doing a job because everyone is screen. Of course, this is not true everywhere, but it is true in many cases. Now, when you identify the risk from screening, then you must do a detailed assessment, which I'm going to talk to you about. What in heaven's this? What do you mean by a detailed assessment? And nutrition support intervention after that, after you have assessed the patient, you have to intervene. Whatever assessment tool we use, it is the intervention that is important. The intervention may be something as simple as just uh, advising the patient with oral nutrition, or it may be something that you advise the patient with oral nutrition supplements. When you say oral nutrition supplements, I don't mean the hundreds of bogus nutritional products that are available in our country and all uh, in many Asian countries and even in many Western countries too. They are genuine scientific formulas, the scientific formula. It's not just anything that you put together and call it an oral supplement. And then if that cannot be done, you have to use two peelings. If that cannot be done, then you have to use parental nutrition. So let's go on to nutrition screening. Now, it is, uh, it, uh, screening is a very rapid thing by which you know that patient is at risk. There are several screening tools that you as a group will be familiar with. The NRS 2000 is a nutrition screening very, very popular. And MUST is malnutrition universal screening tool. The mini nutritional assessment short form is a malnutrition screening tool. I'm going to go through some of these in a little bit of a detail. But all screening tools should be valid, reliable, easy to administer, uses readily available information, and it has to be a low cost. Now, the global leadership initiative on malnutrition is the one that is recommended for all patients. The others, which I will describe in a little bit more of detail, the nutritional risk screening NRS 2002 is also very commonly used all over the world, very popular in Europe. The MUST screening tool is used for hospital community and uh, nursing homes. By nursing homes, I mean long-term care facilities, not nursing home as we understand it here. The mini nutritional assessment short form is for geriatric practice. And uh, malnutrition screening tool is for hospitalized patients. And many of these I'm going to explain to you are based upon the patient's weight. So the nutrition risk screening NRS 2000, the initial screening is what about the BMI? Yes or no? 
weight loss, reduce intake. Is the patient severely ill? Yes or no? Reduce dietary intake. What does the patient say? Yes or no? And then you go on to screen and there are various scores that we do. For example, a weight loss of greater than 5% in three months or a greater than 5% in one month. Uh, and you are, most of you are familiar with this. Mild scores one, two, and three, mild, moderate, and severe. And some of the conditions, for example, if you have a patient with head injury or a critically ill patient, that definitely the score is three. Then you add something for the, then you add something to the age. And finally, you have a score. It, they say that it takes about 15 minutes to do a good nutrition with screening. Remember, this is called a screen. The malnutrition screening tool is the one that I've used in some of my studies. This is based on screening with the, uh, uh, have you lost weight, same as before? How much weight have you lost? And have you been eating poorly? And then if you have a score of two or greater, then it means that the patient is at risk. Again, notice carefully that this is heavily dependent on weight. Malnutrition screening tool, quickly done. And we have uh, trained all our nurses to do that. Even if the patient comes in the middle of the night, this is done. The diagnosis of malnutrition is captured. And the nurse is now empowered to start the patient on oral supplements of any, uh, depending upon the disease state for which the patient has come. Many of you would have heard about the globe, Subjective Global Assessment or SGA. This is very well validated. Here is a new study that shows that it is well validated to diagnose malnutrition in general, cachexia and sarcopenia, about which I'm going to talk a little bit more. And the subjective global uh, assessment is based upon nutrient intake, weight, any symptoms like abdominal pain or vomiting, functional capacity. Uh, are you able to walk well? Uh, has your functional capacity gone down? What is your metabolic requirement? Is the patient in injured, in which case there's a high metabolic rate, and a physical exam. Now, this physical examination, like a doctor does for you, is one of the very most interesting aspects of a dietitian. This is a nutrition-focused physical examination. I'm not asking dietitians to carry a stethoscope and listen to heart sounds or to, or to do a gynae examination. No, not at all so. Uh, dietitians can be very nicely trained with about a day or so of a physical examination, looking at the nails, looking at the skin, then looking at uh, the temporal muscles for wasting, the TNR eminence, there are a lot of things that dietitians can do. And then you have a subjective feeling. Is the patient well-nourished, mildly, moderately malnourished, or severely malnourished? Now, it is true that some people can feel that the patient is mild or moderate or severe, but it doesn't matter if it is subjective. And then two other contributing features are now being crept in at the bottom of the screen. One is cachexia, the, uh, the, the lack of appetite, the lack of appetite, the feeling of despondency, especially in cancer patients, and sarcopenia with reduced muscle uh, loss and strength. The strength in sarcopenia can be very beautifully determined by what's called the hand grip dynamometry, or simple tests that physiotherapists will teach you. You get up from a chair and sit down. Get up from a chair and sit down. How much can you do within a short period of time? And dietitians can be trained to do that. Now, remember, this is called a subjective global assessment, but it is actually a nutrition screening tool, a screening tool. And therefore, there is a confusion between what is screening and what is assessment. In general, a nutritional assessment is supposed to take a little bit more time and requires some training. And more time is needed. And the cost is also needed if you capture the the, the compensation that dietitians are paid uh, for the hospital work. So uh, a screening is something very rapid. Nutrition assessment is uh, a little more expensive. But as you can rightly see, there is an overlap between the two. And one cannot be very sure what we're dealing with because the subjective global assessment in reality actually is a screening tool. Now, regulations in India call for an assessment for all hospitalized patients. But I absolutely agree. But then the intervention is not uniform. It is not regulated at all. If the patient is screened for the risk for malnutrition, our government does not tell you to go back and look for malnutrition in four or five days. And even if they do, it is not always actually 
it is not always actually enforced. And when malnutrition is detected and dictated into the patient's medical records, the diagnosis passes through several layers of medical, legal, medical bureaucratic process. For example, the dietitian says, I, the patient is malnourished, is scheduled for surgery four or five days from now. I want to stay, start the patient on and supplement. The nurse tells you, no, uh, no, you cannot do that. We have to ask a doctor. Okay, call the physician. No, it's a Friday evening. He might have gone to Mahabharapuram with his children, so I can't disturb him. So the poor patient is starving till Monday. Why? Because of the bureaucratic process in the hospital. That is why uh, uh, dietitians, nutrition should be so confident that you will be able to pick up the phone and call the physician and say, this is not right. Or I actually tell, tell the dietitian, tell the patient to get discharged from the hospital and go and get admitted somewhere else because it is not right for somebody to undergo a major operation without any kind of a nutritional assessment. There is also an overconfidence in initial screening. Uh, the, the, the dietitian may say the patient is fine, but then if you do not reassess the patient in four or five days, then that becomes a problem. The dietitian feels, oh, there is no weight loss, but there is an unreliability of weight. A lot of people don't even know their actual weight. And the overconfidence in saying, oh, the patient looks fat, is well nourished, because it belongs to two or three clubs in Chennai. How can that patient be malnourished? Sure, that patient can be malnourished. Not because, not only because of obesity, but it can, but the patient may have electrolyte imbalances, maybe a diabetic, maybe on various medications that can affect the nutritional status of the patient, mainly through electrolytes. Now there is a huge problem with definitions of malnutrition by weight, which is unfortunately what is taught in nursing schools and also nutrition courses. Many patients don't know the weight, and obtaining accurate weight in a hospital requires an act of Congress, an act of parliament. It is so difficult to obtain weight in a hospital and there's a fluctuation in the weight also. For example, the patient comes uh, to the hospital in the morning <coughs> and uh, is fluid overloaded, the, you have a weight and then the physician gives the patient a diuretic, a lot of urine comes out and the weight goes down. So the weight is totally unreliable. And disease related malnutrition is missed in patients, especially obese patients, not realizing that the obese patient can be maldamaged. Now, based on all this in 2012, um, the, the American Society of Parental and Dental Nutrition and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the new name for the American Dietetic Association, just like our own IDA. They said, if you have evidence of insufficient energy intake, decreased functional status, localized fluid accumulation, which is, uh, which is edema, loss of fat, loss of muscle mass, loss of weight, a subjective feeling, and you have two or more, the patient is malnourished. But believe me, this is very confusing. They say insufficient energy intake. They don't talk about insufficient protein intake, which is the biggest thing in the last two or three years, and decreased functional status. So grandpa may say, well, you know, my functional status is fine. I go to the washroom, I watch television, so my functional status is fine. Actually, it is very, very low. And uh, so this is, this is very subjective. And uh, because of that, the Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition wanted to simplify malnutrition, which is what I'm going to tell you. And I would urge all of you to use this to make a diagnosis of malnutrition. Remember, this is a diagnosis. The patient on the left is very often forgotten to, or very often missed to have malnutrition because everyone thinks that the patient is obese. The patient on the right, even the chimpanzee in the local zoo can say the patient is malnourished because the patient is skin and bone. But the truth is both of these patients are at extremely high risk and that can only be captured by global leadership initiated in malnutrition. How are you going to make a diagnosis based on tricep skin fold, where most of the skin fold is essentially fat there. How are you going to get an accurate tricep skin fold in the mid-arm muscle circumference in both these patients? So it is not really, it is really not useful at all. Then you, you have to also understand that BMI that a lot of people use 
does not really tell you how much fat or muscle you have. Now, this is a spot diagram, both males and females, females in gray and males in black, where on the left axis, on the vertical axis, you say uh, the uh, body fat percentage. And on the right side, you see the body mass index. As you can see, it's a huge scatter. So body uh, BMI has a lot of limitations because a, a, a strong athlete may have a high BMI, but it's not malnourished. Similarly, a low BMI in a patient uh, may be actually normal for that particular patient. But I agree with you, a BMI should include, should be included in your notes, but it is not totally reliable because it doesn't capture sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle. That is why the global leaders said they want to simplify it. We want to simplify the definition of malnutrition by using two sets of criteria, etiology and phenotype. Phenotypic criteria are the usual ones you know, weight loss, look, related to low BMI, reduced muscle mass, either subjectively or by using ultrasound on various other methods. And etiology, has the patient taken food less? Is, does the patient have inflammation or a disease burden? Inflammation is very subjective. You don't need lab tests like was done recently during the COVID crisis, all kinds of unnecessary lab test inflammation. It is the feeling, is there a disease that the patient has? Is there a cancer? Is there a major viral infection? Is there a kidney injury? Well, those patients are not inflamed, so to speak. Disease burden. The nice thing about the GLIM criteria, Global Leadership Initiative in Nutrition, is that if you have one etiologic criterion and one phenotypic criterion, you have the diagnosis of malnutrition. That is all you need. So in the dietitian's note, you can say, uh, you know, diagnosis, malnutrition. There are, of course, subdivisions of various kinds of malnutrition, protein calorie mal malnutrition, cachexia, and so on, which I won't go into right now but it can be done. Now, this, this paper is available on the web for free, Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition. It goes through great detail about how dietitians, each one of this, what do you mean by reduced intake of food? You know, what do you mean? Is it subjective? Is it something you document every day? What do you mean by disease burden? What, what are the significance of weight loss, which we have gone through to some extent before? What are the limitations of the BMI? Well, how do you capture reduced muscle mass by a physical examination and also by uh, certain other tests? But one thing that I want to carefully tell you is, have you noticed that you don't use any lab tests here at all? I want you to please understand that serum albumin, a position paper published a few months ago says that serum albumin and pre-albumin are not components of currently accepted definitions of malnutrition. Your textbooks will still, will still uh, say serum albumin. And if you say what I'm saying now, you may not get the right credit in your examinations, but this is the truth. Serum albumin and pre-albumin are not components of currently accepted definitions of, uh, in, in the hospital. Serum albumin levels and pre-albumin do not correlate with nutrient delivery and should not be used to assess adequacy of nutrition delivery. I'll go back to the previous slide. It is true when the body has inflammation, the liver says, I don't want to make albumin anymore because I have a priority to make other kinds of antitoxins, of other kinds of antivirals, and other kinds of antibodies. Therefore, albumin production goes down. So, the low albumin level is because of inflammation and disease. It is not because of the malnutrition part of it. And, and, and also, when the patient becomes better, it is not because of nutrition, but it is better, patient becomes better because the inflammation has actually gone down. Many times you will uh, hear dietitians say, I want to check the albumin level before I say the patient is okay. That again is nonsense. It cannot be used to assess the adequacy of nutrient delivery. Albumin level may go up. Just because the albumin level is normal does not mean you don't have malnutrition. It is neither a positive predictive value or a negative predictive value. And 
In geriatrics, it is especially bad. Now, this study actually used uh, any expensive tests like DEXA, uh, dual absorption, absorptiometry, bioimpedance analysis, and it has no correlation with serum albumin analysis. They did not even correlate with complications. Clearly demonstrate the serum albumin is not a suitable marker for composition in adults. Now, I have to tell you something really interesting. Even though this is the case, I can tell you that many doctors go ahead and give albumin with albumin level is low, uh, telling themselves, well, if I give the albumin and the albumin level is increased, then the patient will no longer qualify to be malnourished. In the first place, you don't need albumin to make a diagnosis of malnutrition. Secondly, you don't, you don't, you cannot correct an artificially correct an albumin level. Some dietitians have asked me, how do I convince doctors about this? Very simple. You ask them, doctor, uh, when you have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, one of those funny diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, the, you'll find that the patient is anemic, low hemoglobin level. But do you give a blood transfusion to, close, to cure the rheumatoid arthritis? No. It is a manifestation of the disease. Okay, so you might be snarled at and said, "Who are you to tell me about it?" You can say, "Doctor, that is a science." You know, you the albumin is not a marker. You cannot give exogenous albumin. Do you know that each dose of albumin is four thousand rupees? Four thousand rupees, and the very same physician who will give albumin will not give hundred rupees worth of an oral nutrition supplement. That is why you have to be bold. This paper, capturing the elusive diagnosis of malnutrition, the same as my lecture now, uh, uh, gives you a lot about the subjectivity of uh, how the dietitians experience in saying that patient is malnourished is as important as in other areas of medicine. Nothing can replace a nutrition-focused physical examination. And I strongly urge you to read this paper. i send you the references later if you like. A word about sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is muscle loss. Very common in elderly patients, trauma, brain injury, bed rest, just lying in bed in critical care. And the diagnosis of sarcopenic obesity, patient is fat, there's no muscle. Now, sometimes uh, scans will tell you that the muscle is large, but it is myosteatosis. Isn't that a nice word? Myo means muscle, steatosis means fat deposit. The muscle is fat because of deposit of fat in it, not because of the muscle. So the diagnosis of sarcopenia is very, very difficult. Clinically, dietitians can look at the quadriceps femoris muscle, look at the skin folds there the, to some extent. And you can look at the thena eminence, which is, I don't know whether you can see me in the thumb. You can also look at uh, uh, hand grip dynamometry. And many patients with sarcopenia are very, very obese. In those of you who may, be, who may be going to other countries to live or to work, you may be privileged to use ultrasound as your practice to make a diagnosis of sarcopenia and malnutrition. In India, ultrasound machines can only be used by physicians because of, uh, because of the abuse of ultrasound that you are familiar with. In, um, in Malaysia and Singapore, a physiotherapist actually use ultrasound machine. Uh, here in India, I've been encouraging the use of ultrasound by the intensive care doctors. In older patients, you'll find that you will find a tremendous loss of muscle that you see in yellow. And you will find more of fat. But actually, the older patient's thigh looks bigger. But the truth is there are not much muscles. And that is extended as a reduced trend. So the role of the dietitian is somehow to maintain this muscle loss. Very often, I'm now asked, I want to get a DEXA scan. I want to buy a bioimpedance analysis. Uh, it's a waste of money. It's a gimmick to make the patient pay more. A CT scan. It may be used for other reasons, but it is not indicated for the diagnosis of malnutrition. In, in patients who've had a CT scan of the abdomen, you can pick out sarcopenia. A bioimpedance analysis, at least three people have called me in the last six months saying that uh, 
the hospital administrators want us to buy one and they're forcing us to buy one. There is no reason at all because if you, if you have optimized the diagnosis of magnification, screening, assessment, and if you've started early feeding, you avoid unnecessary medications. You completely avoid kitchen prepared blenderized diets that are so commonly used in India, not realizing that they cause too many complications and that they are actually more expensive than the scientific process. So when all that is taken care of, high tech tools will be used for research purposes. Great project for students, BSc or MSc students. But it is not necessary for day-to-day -day nutritional assessment if you use just a simple GLIM limb criteria. So I have uh, given you the references for using ultrasound to detect sarcopenia. It is very inexpensive, and I'll be happy to share this with you. Those of you who will be going into practice or are already in dietary practice can uh, use these references to convince hospital administrators that because now everything may be all right for you, but you detect sarcopenia based on ultrasound, you have a diagnosis of malnutrition, you have a diagnosis of sarcopenia, and you can now tell this patient that he or she needs a high, higher protein diet. Now, we come to now nutritional assessment. After you've done the screening, the nutritional assessment, this is the time when you collect all the data put together. It will, to do a good assessment, it will take you almost one hour. You have to list all the clinical conditions, what are, with whatever body composition that you have and is relevant for that particular patient. You have to list all the malnutrition diagnoses. What are the present medical history? What are the medicines that the patient is on? And what are the drug nutrient interactions at Kiraka, which is a whole lecture by itself. I know dietitians who have uh, told physicians uh, the reason why this patient has this problem is because of a low phosphate level. Another uh, thing is, uh, this gives me the opportunity to urge dietitians to learn about sodium, potassium, magnesium, and uh, you know, magnesium and phosphate. For example, uh, everyone these days and their mothers-in-law are on acid-reducing agents, you know, uh, things like pantoprazole and omoprazole and so on. Those are notorious for magnesium deficiencies. I've seen patients who almost died in the hospital because of magnesium defects and cardiac arrhythmias, fatal, almost fatal. Your assessment will say, well, the patient is on these medications. Can you please check a magnesium level? You will be saving the patient's life by paying attention not only to nutrition, but also to electrolytes. Anthropometric details, you have to mention, are you, am I using actual, ideal, or adjusted way? Nutrition-focused physical examination selected lab test and the summary of assessment, and then you say oral, enteral, parenteral combinations. Now, I want to tell you about Chelly uh, Nutrition, uh, last couple of slides. The paper on the right is E-Nutrition, a paper I authored, and the other one performed recently, uh, you know, published recently. In the present COVID uh, pandemic, we clearly realized that dietitians can do a lot of their work on a lot of their work on online, not giving bogus uh, advice to people about how to improve their quote unquote immunity by nutrition and charging huge amounts of money. No, this is a good nutritional assessment can be done online using a cell phone or using an iPad or using a computer. And these are two wonderful references, which I really want you to think about that nutritional assessment can be done. In the so my concluding remarks are the prevalence of malnutrition uh, is uh, is pretty high. 30 to 55 percent of patients are uh, malnourished at the time of admission, and 33 percent of severely malnourished patients, and 38 percent of well-nourished patients. Nutritional status declines while they are in the hospital, and after discharge, nobody cares about it. Uh, they are not given the right advice. I've done several studies to show that by giving simple oral nutrition supplements two patients at the hospital and post-discharge, their chances of getting readmitted to the hospital is much less. And the quality of life is actually much better. Now, the dietitian's role these days is to, is redefined as to support muscle strength. Dietitian's role is not to go into the kitchen, not to uh, do food trays. For that, you can have other, uh, other set, other pathways, other career paths. 
The clinical dietitian's role is to support muscle strength. All the others listed here, the physiotherapist and the intensivist, APP at the bottom means advanced practice provider. Now, everything is important, but we feel that it's the dietitian's role that is very, very important with everything put together. They are, the dietitian is the liaison between the patient and the family. So thank you very much. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then I am open for any questions or criticisms. And if you don't agree with me, you have no way of throwing tomatoes or rotten eggs at me because we are on a Zoom call. But this is, a, this is the modern way of uh, capturing the diagnosis of my Thank you, Dr. Sriram. It was an excellent talk, and I think uh, it's uh, it's an eye opener for the girls who are just going to you know like continue into the PG programs and also get into hospitals as dietitians. So uh, it's the it's now open for discussions. Anybody, uh, you can post your questions on the chat box, or you can unmute and ask, Doctor. I have one, uh, it's, I mean, uh, it's more, it's not really, a, a, I don't know if it's a question or whatever, like when we are doing like research projects and the community, and we are doing nutrition screening for underweight and overweight and all that. And we use that, like, and we also publish those papers. So is it enough to just go with the screening or even assessment has to be done at that stage? Uh, see, an assessment mm. uh, means intervention. Okay, you can you can change the way you deal with it because you must look at the aim. Okay? You must you must look at the aim. Okay, basically you have to look at the aim of the of the you have to look at the aim of the uh, the what you are going to be doing in the community. So you in the community you look quite a bit on weight loss. But one third of children are obese mm. in cities. Do you ever consider that as being managed? Yeah. Huh? You uh, ever yeah. consider that as being managed? Yes. So, uh, and then a physical examination, it's not possible to do it. There is a privacy to do a physical examination in patients. So, for, uh, for the screening for community, there are there are also, the GLIM criteria can also be used. Now, my knowledge of community assessment is only for patients who are sick and who may need to come to the hospital. Yeah, that's what I you know, understood this yeah. as. Yeah, that is all that is all I'm into. So I'm not the right person to answer your question. Is that enough? Okay. So you see, I'm not the right person. However, if you can intervene, that is good, isn't it? Yes, right. that we do. That we do. We that so that intervention is the assessment, isn't it? Okay, okay. The intervention no, no, no. is assessment. But then for you to spend one hour going through all the medic medications and all that, it's not practical. Yes. You know, certainly not practical. Yes. So there is somebody and who- And you're also not trained in that, so. Yeah, you're not trained. So so community nutritionists are very good. That is their job. You see, that is a job. They, they will, uh, they'll be able to do that a little bit better. So yeah. our job, uh, my job uh, is actually, to encourage dietitians to pick up those cues in your screen that will benefit the patient if they, if they happen to become sick. Okay? Uh, you know, uh, for example, how often do you look into the patient's face and eyes during that thing? That training is very important, though. You know, for example, uh, if uh, you can see me on the screen, well, correct? You can see my face on the screen. Suppose you are looking at the patient and you find a small little yellow plaque over there. Okay? Those are cholesterol deposits. Mm. You know, and the dietitian can ask the patient, have you ever had a lipid profile done? You see, our job is to prevent heart disease in the public, in the community, correct? Correct. correct. So, so a good physical examination, I think you should, uh, you should include nutrition focused physical exam as part of your BSA course. It's very useful, very, very useful. And you can learn a lot of this online also. Okay. You can learn a lot of it on. Thank you so much. There no, are some somebody questions. Had a question. Sorry? No, somebody. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. There are some. Uh, 
uh, also some questions in the ask? chat. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Go ahead. And then there are some questions on uh, the chat. Yeah. Good evening, sir. This is Danisha from MOP Vaishnava College, sir. The presentation yeah. was really very interesting. And thank you thank for you. the organizers for hosting this. Sir, actually, I'm having one personal doubt. Uh, like, it's not somewhat related to malnutrition, but normally, sir, how does the gene affect the uh, growth of an like person? Like, uh, like I'm a very lean person, sir, and I, I used to eat a lot of proteins and everything. Then, I, then also, I couldn't be able to gain weight. And when I went to an ox store, many doctors, nutritionists, they told that it is all because of your gene. So do you really think so that uh, the gene plays such an important role in weight gaining, sir? Yeah. So I'm not a genesis, uh, but it is true. It is absolutely true that if you take, uh, so, so this gives me an opportunity to answer your question. Dietitians absolutely love saying this is the, uh, this is the energy need for a patient. They'll say, uh, my, my calculation based upon Harris Benedict equation that is 135 years old, that nobody should be using anymore, uh, and various other formulas. My calculation is the patient needs 1,742 calories per day. Okay, and then make a diet chart for that. Uh, my answer to that is even God doesn't know how many calories a person needs. He was better than God. Okay, so in the general public, the calorie requirement. From person, from person to person, there is by 15%. You see, you will have a friend of yours who can eat all the ice creams they want and remain thin. You know, everyone will be jealous of that. Other people have to be very, very careful for not eating because there is a variation in the normal person in the public. In the hospital, it is even worse. Okay, we cannot really know exactly how many calories. So that is indeed genetic. There is no doubt at all in your, but then you must be comfortable with your weight. If you are healthy, if you are walk, if you're walking, it's okay. Some people remain thin for the entire life. However, you have to be seen by a physician, you know, make sure you don't have any hypothyroid condition or other endocrine problems because you're not going to put on weight or anything. But then it doesn't matter if you have eaten very well and you, because you want to put on muscle weight, you don't want to put on fat. So it is true. Now, the other part of it is where I get questioned very often. Doctor, I'm not able to lose weight. Not, not that I take care of weight reduction in my practice that much. I'm not able to uh, lose weight because my mother was fat and uh, it is in my genes. That is the place where I disagree. You know, there are certain people who are genetically programmed to, uh, to put on more weight. Absolutely true. There is no doubt at all. And in South India, in India in general, there is a tendency to put on abdominal uh, fat. You'll see folks who are very, very thin, but they, uh, they would stand there with a huge punch. Okay, that is also genetic. That is also genetic. And so, but it can always be controlled to some extent. So there are two ends of the spectrum, uh, thin and obese. Now, something very interesting that, uh, Gauri, this is a fantastic project for your students. The gut microbiome. Okay, this is absolutely fascinating. The bacteria in our gut, the bacteria in our gut will tell us whether we are going to be fat or fat. And they've done experiments, you won't believe it, where they've taken stool from a fat person. I won't say fat, it's not right to use the thing. Overweight person and given it to a thin person and they put on weight. They don't give it by mouth, they give it through a tube. And the opposite is also true. You know, you take stool from a thin person, uh, from, a, uh, from thin and fat, and they gain weight. So a lot of it is the gut microbiome. It's a fantastic project because nowadays we can get the, uh, you know, we can get what kind of bacteria in our gut. You know, what is the good bacteria and the bad bacteria and things like that. So there are a lot of components over there. I'm sorry for giving you a very long answer to a very beautiful question. Thank you, sir. So one more. Sorry to like taking a lot of time. Thank you for the explanation, no sir. So can you, sir, is that protein shake or protein supplement good for weight gaining, sir? Protein supplement, like whey protein. Only if your, see, if your protein intake is good, you don't need supplements. You see, yeah. which is a little bit difficult for vegetarians. I agree with you. 
but if your protein intake is good you don't need supplements at all protein intake per se by by itself is not enough unless there is exercise there is uh, unless the muscles are exercised both by isometric and isotonic exercises so uh, just taking the protein alone is not protein is again 4 calories per cc per 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 gram so just taking protein alone will help you to build up more protein which uh, will help you to build up more muscle but if you want to gain weight you should take regular diet a person like you uh, participating in a webinar should be healthy in mind and in body you don't need supplements you know you just got to eat uh, take a snack or something in between meals if you really want to gain thank weight, you so much thank you there are some more questions can i just uh... yes, i have i have all the time don't worry yeah uh, so there's a question from tanushri jain what are the best tools to measure sarcopenia the the best tools okay so the best tool the most practical tool to measure sarcopenia at present is ultrasound ultrasound of the quadriceps femoris mid thigh that is the best there are these other tools i mentioned ct scans and all that which are not practical you don't get a ct scan just for the sake of nutritional assessment and the physical examination so physical examination uh, by as i told you the temporal uh, muscle wasting um the thumb you know the pinar muscle so those are the tools then you can look at functional status functional status is hand grip dynamometry that's yeah. something that makes me not always useful but to some extent it is that's all we can say you know it is not always useful or uh the the quality of life indices like getting up from the chair walking 30 feet climbing some steps and so on there is a function of the muscle so those are the best tools uh it's not uh, it's it is a very difficult diagnosis to make but fortunately in the glim criteria the dietitian's subjective feeling of sarcopenia is given tremendous weight so you don't need lab test or diagnostic test to confirm that thank you there's another one how are hand calipers and hand dynamo meters beneficial in hospitalized patients yeah so hand uh, hand grip dynamo metry is useful to some extent there is no doubt at all but then you know you should look at if the patient has an iv in the hand how are they going to do the hand grip correct then if they are sedated and lying down in bed and on a ventilator how are you going to do that you know so there are certain limitations that is no doubt at all but the usefulness there is not to make a diagnosis but to track the patient that is as four or five days on the road if the hand grip is going lower then you know that the patient is getting more malnourished more sarcopenia that you have to increase the protein and energy intake so that is the usefulness of it by hand calipers i'm not very sure what the person needs by hand calipers is it the calipers for measuring the rise of skin fold and all that uh i don't know they haven't uh, specified that. Uh, yeah they haven't mentioned that yeah see the I think hand calipers yeah that, you know Pin when a patient is lying down in bed all the fluid goes to the back so you really cannot measure it very well by calipers i think that's what the person really needs you know uh mid arm circumference and triceps and all that they are they are okay for community maybe but then again is that going to change my intervention to the patient absolutely not therefore why do it that is why we have completely abandoned using tricep skin fold and mid arm circumference uh, for hospitalized patients you know it doesn't help you in any way because your intervention is not going to change uh, thank you one uh, there are two i think two or three more uh, hi sir excellent presentation is there any standardized nutrition assessment form for patient coming in opd setting or can you suggest which will be best suited for nutrition clinic in yeah. opd setting there are in an outpatient there are several forms available the the glim criteria can also be used there are several forms that will be available the mini nutrition screening tool the nrs 2000 you know the nrs 2000 can also be used and uh, if you ask some of the uh, senior dietitians at some of the hospitals here they have actually designed a lot of uh, forms uh, to suit our uh, thing so you can get it Uh, from there but the glim criteria can also be very beautifully used in the outpatient after all you are screening it correct you are doing an assessment you are screening it and then 
uh, in your assessment, you are not thinking like a dietitian, remember, you're thinking like a physician. I won't even say pseudo physician. I'm, you must be thinking like a physician. Okay, the patient has diabetes. Uh, how, can I, how can I give the patient more information, uh, genuine information than what is available on the net? Because half the things on the net is all bogus. You see, very difficult for the lay person to sift through that. So you, 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 became, you become a disease focused uh, dietitian. And that will be the outpatient setting. The very fact that the patient is an outpatient means that the patient has come to see the hospital for a certain problem, correct? So immediately you know, in the GLIM criteria, immediately you know the disease burden is captured. You have one etiology criteria already established. So now you have to just look at the etiology, uh, you have to look at the phenotype, you know, a little bit more and see what is the weight, has the weight gone down, is it progressing down? Then you have one on each side, then you have a diagnosis of malnutrition. Okay, and then all the other factors of malnutrition that go in all the diseases, and then you can advise the patient very nicely and appreciate. Oh, that is the kind of dietitian. You see, that is what I would encourage you. Thank you. Uh, the Asian BMI is different from WHO BMI. When an Asian is living in the US, which BMI is applicable? Um, uh, we don't use BMI at all in our, in our practice, you know. It is, see, uh, it uh, at least, uh, it is something that is in our notes, but we don't usually use it. The Asian BMI is actually lower. That is why you cannot classify people as obese based upon, uh, you know, or well-nourished based upon the European or the American diabetes. So we discussed this recently in the PENSA, Parental and Entry Association of Asia Congress. So, uh, this is for classifying the patient. You're presenting it to the administration to say so many patients are malnourished. But your intervention that you're going to be doing is not going to change. You see? So uh, the, we have to use the Asian B. That is uh, quite true. That is quite true. Uh, we use the Asian BMI not only to make a uh, in a diagnosis where people are less, less uh, below the ideal, but also above the ideal. So, uh, so you know, person 25 and above overweight uh, in the West, you know, here we might say uh, if uh, 19 or 20 or 21 is all right, you might say even a person is 21, it's got to be kept. So that's my answer to that. Thank you. Uh, there are two more questions. Before I ask the questions, the feedback form is also posted in the chat box. Participants kindly fill it to avail your certificates, e-certificates. Uh, the other questions are, sir, which are the best biochemistry biomarkers for malnutrition? Dietitians are getting trained for NFPE. Yeah, so, uh, so um, it, it's a good question, but I covered this already in my talk, correct? There are no biochemical markers at all, okay. zero. You know, zero. You don't need any biochemical markers for diagnosing malnutrition. And that has been the statement, not only it is, don't say it is Dr. Sriram's view. I don't say it is my view. It is the society's view also. Now, I don't know whether the IDA and others have changed. That is not my job. But the American Dietetic Association is begging dietitians, please don't use lab tests. It is not needed at all. The lab, the absolutely no reason at all to use any lab test, albumin, pre-albumin, transferrin, or anything at all. No predictive value, no positive or negative value. The lab test you will need is not for making a diagnosis of malnutrition. It is all the adjuvant treatments that you will be giving, the sodium, the potassium, the phosphate levels, the BUN, the creatinine, the liver enzymes, glucose levels, hemoglobin A1C, you see what I mean? It is for that part. It is not for making the diagnosis of the malnutrition at all. So the question was, what lab tests do we need to diagnose malnutrition? And the answer is no. Okay, you know. Now, I know one thing for sure. Those of you who are going to be working in a hospital, if you don't order the lab tests, you know, if you don't order the lab tests, the, the physician or the administrator will come and tell you, you need to order more lab tests. Okay, you need to order so you have only two choices, either leave the job and go somewhere else where ethical medicine is practiced, or you'll be bold enough to look into the doctor's eye, 
give them a copy of this paper and say, no, lab tests are not needed for malnutrition. You know, uh, and so I, I'm very bold in, in saying this, you know, uh, you know, quite often. The patient has to say, I don't want the lab test. You know, I encourage patients to ask doctors, how is your treatment going to change because of these tests? And you won't believe some of these lab tests cost 10,000, 15,000 rupees. You know, absolute waste of money. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you how you can deal with it in your hospital. And I'm not going to ask you to change your answer in your examinations. I can only tell you the present tree, uh, 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 the, the present philosophy and the teaching is don't use lab tests to diagnose malnutrition. What are your views on malnutrition in post-COVID scenario? Yeah, but in, in post-COVID, you have to, uh, uh, many patients has, have long COVID. They don't eat very well. So uh, we have absolutely no evidence to show right now, at present, to show that taking any oral nutrition supplements in the community prevents a person from getting COVID. There is absolutely no evidence to show that giving mega doses of vitamin C, zinc, or all that has any effect at all. They're all money-making rackets. No evidence at all. While the patient has COVID in the hospital or even treated at home, it is all right, they definitely need some kind of a supplement, a scientific formula. But there is there because it is treated like any other critical illness, like, like anything else. Specifically for COVID itself, there are some data that keeps coming in. But COVID is in some ways different from other critical illness. In some ways, it's not critical. Illness. So we treat it like anyone else. Okay? So post-COVID is also a situation, at least for 30 days to even 60 days, patients will need a good diet supplemented with some kind of an oral nutrition supplement in between weeks. And there are several available in the market, and those are good. Uh, of course, needless to say, the ideal thing will be always to have a good balanced diet with plenty of fruits and vegetables that you guys know about better than me. Uh, but in the post book, but you do not, and also you don't need to give mega doses of any multivitamins or trace elements. The standard dose is all that you actually need. Does that answer the question? Uh, I think so. Thank you so much. I think the rest of us, one is like, uh, they want to know if there are any good uh, books for clinical uh, uh, practice. Yeah. There, are, uh, there are lots of books on, uh, there are lots of books on clinical nutrition available. But what I would tell you is that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, you don't need to waste money on textbooks because a lot of things are available online. A lot of books are available on eBooks. Um, now it also depends on what part of clinical nutrition you want to learn. It is like saying, can we buy a textbook of medicine? A textbook of medicine is 4,000 pages. So there are there is a good book on clinical nutrition by, by YK Joshi, for example. You know, that's a good book. Uh, uh, but, but then it, it mixes a lot of things like community, pediatrics, uh, gynecology, obstetrics, and everything together. So when you want to go into that focus and area, there is tons of material available online. Now, if you, I can specifically tell you, if you need information on hospital-based nutrition, there are fantastic websites. For example, the website of the American Society for Parental Nutrition, ASPEN, is nutritioncare.org. Another fantastic website is the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force. Okay, very, very beautiful website. You get tons of information for free the British Association, the, and then uh, fortunately, many of the publications that are coming out in many journals in the world are available for free because the WHO and various societies have said, if public funding paid by taxpayers is benefiting the organization or the author, that paper must be given for free. That is the reason why you say open access in many journals. So uh, now, having said that, if you need a specific answer on any specific uh, question, um, you can write to me and I will send you whatever papers I have on that particular thing. Okay. 
Lastly, Gauri, textbooks take about four years to publish. In the four years, medical knowledge changes. Even by the time the textbook is published, the information becomes outdated. You see, and that is why it is very, uh, it is extremely important that when we train young dietitians, there are two parallel trainings, just as I train physicians when I was working in Madras. I would tell them, I'm training you to be a good doctor based upon evidence, but I'm not training you to pass your examination because if you tell your examiners what I tell you, you will definitely fail, <laughs> okay? So please keep this dual pathway in your mind, you know, the, the dual pathway. There's so many beautiful articles available online and uh, go to good sources, you know, in a, in a good sources. Otherwise you'll find lots, of, lots and lots of bogus information. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. It was really a good presentation. We learned a lot of new things. Um, so personally, I would like to ask you a question. What are your views on varicose veins and how can a dietitian um, play a major role in curing this varicose yeah. veins? So uh, what gives you the idea that dietitians can cure varicose veins? First question. What makes you think that varicose veins has anything to do with diet? Number two, what gives you the idea that dietitians uh, can cure varicose veins by diet? Absolutely no relationship. Okay? Absolutely no relationship at all between the two. So um, if somebody asks you, you should just say, I'm sorry, you know, we have to first find out why the varicose veins are there. Is it, uh, I, I, I won't bore you with all the details. There are several reasons for varicose veins uh, yeah, by, you know, the vein is obstructed or something. But nutrition and diet has nothing to do with it, except if the patient is overweight. That is the only thing. Otherwise, there is no... Oh, uh, I meant that way, sir, because uh, most of them are overweight and then they, yeah. uh, that causes uh, okay, varicose veins. Just vein. follow the standard overweight uh, things, you know. Don't let them tell you that it's in the genes, you know. The standard overweight uh, things uh, have them come to you and not go to some weight reduction uh, studios, which are plentiful in all big cities. You know, simple thing, simple thing like explaining uh, principles of obesity, explaining that uh, you know, in days gone by, we used to say 50% exercise, 50% diet, no longer true. It is 80% diet, 20% exercise. 80% of weight reduction can only come from diet. So, you know, there are various things about uh, thing about uh, meal portions and uh, many of you are quite experts in it. But it is also a motivation. And uh, also when, uh, uh, now if your patient is a lady or a man, may I ask, is the patient a lady or a man? Uh, ladies. Lady. Please make sure that the husband comes also to the presentation. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, help uh, women lose weight unless the husbands are also part of this whole thing, you know. Uh, it, it, it's a very complex uh, situation. If you want somebody to lose weight, you don't bring sweets home and, and you don't overeat at home. And, yes, uh, I, I can family, family has. So uh, weight reduction is a really a big thing. I'm not an expert. Nobody comes to me for weight reduction. I just talk to you about these things and general principles and put the fear of God in them. That is the main thing, you know. Put the fear of God. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to waste too much time. But the, but the thing is, you uh, that the, the analogy is that in many countries uh, they try to avoid uh, tobacco chewing by putting pictures of mouth cancer on the fridge door. You know, not on the fridge door, uh, on the package of the tobacco, and say if you chew tobacco, you'll get mouth cancer. Similarly, I advise my patients to put surgical complications of some wound or something on the fridge door. And you go to open the fridge to have a snack in the middle of the night, you say, I'm not going to have. That's called negative reinforcement. So these are all tricks that I can tell you, but I'm not an expert in that. So you guys are better. Yes. Than Thank you very much, sir. Uh, since I saw a lot of view videos regarding food and, you know, varicose veins, I thought of asking you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. No problem. Uh, there are no more questions. A lot of appreciation from... Uh, the participants and everybody has mentioned that it was an excellent presentation and they have really learned a lot. So thank you so much for spending your time here today.
and on a rainy day and all of us at home we have really utilized this uh, one and a half maybe uh, less than that um, very very usefully thank you so much now yeah. i would yeah i i would request dr sheila john our uh, pg head and vice principal to propose the word of thanks Good evening. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Department of Home Science, Women's Christian College, and the Nutrition Society of India, Chennai chapter, to propose a vote of thanks. Actually, all our participants here have made my work very easy. And all of us have really learned a lot. And uh, Dr. Krishnan Sriram, we want to thank you for the time you spent to give us such an informative and interesting talk. And you made it so easy for us to understand with your simple language and along with that all the research articles that you presented and we have really gained a lot and i think it's really one hour of a uh, lot of learning that we have done i'm so grateful to you and i'd like to thank dr sharifa and ms suganti from the nsi for uh, organizing so many informative lectures in fact many times i will be attending these lectures and i would be thinking when are we going to do it with wcc so when Dr. Gauri brought the suggestion forward, we immediately took on to this and we are so grateful that we could have it. And every time we have uh, heard uh, talks with Dr. Usha Sriram, which we do it regularly every year, I've always thought it's uh, you know, really important for us to listen to Dr. Krishna Sriram. And this has become a reality for us. And so I'm really, really grateful to you, Doctor, for spending time and speaking to us. I'd like to thank Dr. Mary Pramila and the faculty of the Department of Home Science for their support and all the students and NISM members for participating and making this webinar a success. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Gauri. I hope Dr. Sriram will be able to speak to us sometime uh, later also in a real uh, life seminar when you come to college. Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much. I think, yeah, we can leave the meet. Thank you, all the participants, and thank you, Dr. Sheila and Dr. Mary, Dr. Yes, Sagan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Gauri. It was an excellent uh, presentation, and uh, thank you for arranging it. No, I was like, I just grabbed this opportunity since he was in town, and, uh, you know, we were able to manage. Otherwise, the time difference becomes an issue. So we're able Actually, to do we've it. heard and... so much of Dr. Sriram that I'm really waiting to listen to him and you made it a reality. But we did have him in college a couple of times. College I think some time uh, back, yeah. but then after that, it has been a long time. Yeah, this after was a topic that I thought uh, will be of use to our students also. So mm, correct, correct. It was really good, and I'm so glad uh, Thank you. everyone was. Yeah, it was such a what do you say knowledge uh, gaining uh, our, for the past one hour. No, excellent. I know <laughs> today's <laughs> rainy days. Uh. Uh, it was raining knowledge to us actually today. Absolutely, <laughs> correct, correct. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.